to this idea of course corrections, you know, um, Jerry Saltz a couple of weeks ago came out with that article and said, you know, I actually hope some parts of the art world shrink a little bit after this, you know, there was too much going on in some respects, whatever. Uh, New York Times uh, newspaper yesterday had that big article where they were talking to curators of biennials and triennials and saying, what happens to art if people can't go to this cool city to, to see, you know, artists that have been brought together from around the world? What happens to the art world? And um, so none of us know for sure, right? But I think that's the game that we're all playing right now is thinking long term to a day when we're out of the weeds a little bit with this pandemic and what the art world looks like. So I don't know if you guys have, have thought a little bit about, you know, sort of what curating looks like in the future, what an art experience looks like in the future once we're on the other side of this. A great question. I mean, we're kind of doing that right now. I mean, mm -hmm. this conversation is, a, is, is kind it's of a framing of that. Of mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, we, when we started the gallery in 2003, we never had intended to open up like a physical space, right? That was not in the cards for us. It was just like not where the opportunity was, not where we felt the, the need was going to be met by opening up a bricks and mortar space. It was really about communicating about artists and their ideas and, you know, showing their work and interviewing them. And the technology 17 years later has made this so much more you know, efficient and accessible uh, for most people, not everyone, but for most people, accessible mm -hmm. for sure. So I feel like we're, you know, this idea of like the art world transitioning back to being online, you know, we were there in the early 2000s when no one was online and yeah. we were trying to say, you know, we're doing this thing and it's on the internet and we would get these blank stares and <laughs> like, what? And this is at a period of time when we were literally curating exhibitions online mm -hmm. and no one had any inkling of what the hell that meant nothing yeah so you know the fact that the people are going to be curating shows online or they have these virtual viewing rooms or they're building virtual architectural gallery spaces or there's a massive contraction in the art fairs which wasn't really a thing up until like maybe a dozen years ago you know where that kind of like art fair somewhere on the face of the planet every week is literally what it became um that will contract for sure you know um and again, I don't know if it's going to go in the direction of like Jerry Saltz, like where he's pretty, mm -hmm. he could be, and I'm a supporter of Jerry Saltz. He's been very supportive of us as well, but he can be pretty nostalgic for the art world that existed when he came of age as an artist and then transitioning into a, a writer, which is the 60s, 70s, non-market, you know, artist DIY art world. And that has always existed and that will always exist. And that right. will not change. Mm -hmm. It's just what's been given kind of front, front mm -hmm. of stage spotlight, which is money. You know, it's like money, 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 money. And who's got the biggest gallery and how many galleries and how much are you making and what stuff is selling for. And really like the market has dominated the conversation for so long and that's been really unhealthy. So if there's any correction to this at all, I'm hoping that it'll get away from like, well, how much is that? Yeah. Or how much did that sell for? How much was that grant? Or how many awards or how many biennials or how many art fairs and what the booth costs and all that other bullshit. And it gets back to being like, what are you making? And why are you making this? Mm -hmm. And who are you making this for? And what do you hope to elicit in all of this? So it returns back to this kind of like, what's the mission of this? And what's the, the vision of, of, the, of, of, of doing this at all? Like, what are you hoping to accomplish with this? Whatever this thing is, this physical object you're making, this live experience that you're, right. you're crafting, mm -hmm. you know? And I feel like it's been so out of whack, that scale. I'm hoping maybe it'll come back a little bit into equilibrium in, you know, in the next few years. Uh, but it's really hard to say. I mean, you probably read mm -hmm. that article too. Um, I showed it to Rosanna where um, a baby came out at the end of March, an article by Mark. Glimpshire mm -hmm. uh, uh, Pace Gallery. So he's the son of Arnie Glimpshire. He's the president of the company. And he actually came down with COVID-19 in early March. He didn't know he had it. You know, he wasn't able to pass it on to his family. So he was grateful about that. But he'd been sick for three weeks solidly and then wrote an article saying, you know, and I've had three weeks of reflection time on like what's important. And in the article, you know, they've got this mega multinational art industrial complex that they've built that employed something like 170 people 
So that's not Jerry Assault's art world from the 1970s where there's two people at the gallery. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and even Mark Glimsher said that that was unsustainable in this article. Wow. I don't know him from anything and I'm a fan of Pace and they've been very helpful with us in various projects. But, you know, if they're seeing it at that very top end of that market mm -hmm. and we're seeing it at our alternative end of the market <laughs> and we're seeing galleries closing and writers lamenting, like something's got to change. Yeah. You know? But I think, um, and not only from the art uh, perspective, I feel like New York had changed so much. And, and I'm not an New original New Yorker, but I have been there for 26 years. And I have to say, I always live in Brooklyn since I arrived from Puerto Rico. And it had changed so much that it, it was very convenient, uh, you know, the stores and just getting everything within the, you know, a block uh, from a gym to getting your nails done to getting fancy food. But it, it was lacking what we saw when we move into the city, uh, which was the character of the, the amazing mix and beauty of that part of cultures and creativity. So when, when we finished Pratt, we moved to Carroll Gardens and Borum Hill where we were living and everybody said, you know, you live in Williamsburg first and then when you get more uh, established, right, or you start a family as an artist, then you move into this other neighborhood and you could see it when we were there. But for the last maybe 10, 10 or so years, there was not, that balance was not there. No the creative people were obviously moving out and we were there just because we happened to uh, find a, an apartment that we invested in. But it's really something that I think artists, um, sometimes we don't think this way of um, how our investments, even if we don't have much, which we didn't, uh, but then that establishes a neighborhood and maybe it makes it less likely to change mm -hmm. into this out of control place, which I feel that's how Brooklyn uh, became. And a lot of uh, people that I have talked to in the arts and not just living in the city tell me the same thing as Jerry Salt is uh, mentioning, even though I didn't read it, but it's that nostalgia of, well, maybe this makes New York back into what it used, what it to, used be. to be. Yeah. Instead of like the rot, the, the, the rents skyrocketing Going constantly. Going crazy and, and it's so hard to do you know. any small business. Our small business friends in Brooklyn are managing, same here because we have the, the city uh, families that have moved in here. So we have a little bit of uh, the same in both places and they're working so hard to supply people with food. If they have a restaurant or if they have a bakery or if they have whatever, food or, or product that they, they sell in their small businesses. They're really coming up with these very creative ways of keeping that business, which is very inspiring to see how you can make something out of a crisis. It's really amazing. And these are just like, you know, uh, couples with children. So they're managing the, the, uh, so homeschooling, the business, they're making sure they are not sick, you know, it's a lot mm -hmm. and they are doing it. So I feel like maybe this is a good way for artists to see that sometimes mm -hmm. we have to really take a little bit more power and say, you know what, I could rent this studio forever, but then they can kick me out of here or maybe say, you know what, maybe I just save some money and buy something and nobody can kick me out of this and Brooklyn is not going to change the way it changed. So I don't know, maybe we'll bring that power back to artists because obviously things are over expensive in the city and they, you know, we like, like the story of Soho that everybody loves of all the artists in that area and then now it's a boutique uh sh fancy shops that nobody can afford um so maybe this will be a good lesson for us to keep pushing to have more power 
not only through the art, but by the decisions that we make and give us power, you know, not, you know, political, but also establishing our roots somewhere and saying, this is, I bought this, this is mine, this is our community. And I don't want to be pushed around every time that a landlord wants to get more money. So I don't know, maybe this is a, a, an experience. I, I, I compare it a little bit about gardening because, you know, when you plant seeds, then you have to we, uh, take the little seedlings out and you keep the stronger ones in there. So that's a good way of seeing it. You know, who stays in the ground to grow bigger and who you take out to, to be able to give enough space to something stronger.